President Biden and Donald Trump both there late today, just demonstrating how significant this issue is with the presidential election this November. In a strong move to deal with the growing Texas border crisis, President Biden's administration has introduced a powerful set of actions showing a big change in the U.S. border policy. The Department of Homeland Security is increasing its work, catching 17,000 people smuggling humans. Extra military forces from the Department of Defense are being sent to the border. Join us to discover the changes President Biden has made, which could reshape the borders of the world's most powerful nation. Chapter 1. The Melting Pot Myth if you think the history of U.S. immigration policy is a tale of open arms and unending opportunity, think again. It's more like a saga of shifting tides, where America's supposed embrace of diversity often collides with its undercurrents of xenophobia and economic self-interest. The evolution of U.S. immigration policies paints a picture of transformation and ongoing tension and contradiction. Let's start with the iconic Ellis Island, opened in 1892. It's often romanticized as a beacon of hope and liberty, yet this narrative glosses over the complex and often harsh realities faced by those 12 million immigrants. Fast forward to 1965, and you have the Immigration and Nationality Act dismantling national origin quotas. While progressive, this move wasn't just about fairness, but also about aligning with shifting geopolitical strategies during the Cold War era. The early 20th century was no golden age either. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Immigration Act of 1924 were less about managing immigration and more about preserving a certain American identity, one that was alarmingly narrow and exclusionary. These policies weren't mere blips, but rather reflective of deeply rooted nativist sentiments. Post-World War II, America did make some strides towards inclusivity, but let's not kid ourselves. These changes were as much about international image and labor needs as they were about humanitarian concerns. The Refugee Act of 1980 and the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 were steps forward, but they also underscored America's ambivalence, cracking down on unauthorized workers while reluctantly acknowledging the economic necessity of immigrant labor. The turn of the 21st century brought its own brand of reform often dressed up in the garb of national security. Acts like the Enhanced Border Security and Visa Entry Reform Act of 2002 and the Secure Fence Act of 2006 suggest a nation more interested in fortifying its borders than in understanding the complexities of migration. These policies, ostensibly for protection, also conveniently fed into a narrative of fear and control. The Obama and Trump eras were a study in contrasts, with DACA emerging as a lifeline for many yet remaining, a precarious and temporary fix, perpetually caught in legal limbo. The Trump administration's push for a border wall, meanwhile, was less a practical solution and more a political symbol, playing to a base fueled by nativist fears rather than addressing the root issues of migration. Beneath these legislative and executive whirlwinds lies a legal immigration system that, while claiming to prioritize family ties, employment needs, and humanitarian protection, also reveals the country's ongoing struggle to balance its identity as a land of opportunity with its preoccupations over security and economic pragmatism. Today, we find the Biden administration attempting to steer the ship in a different direction with a series of executive actions and proposals. However, these efforts, while laudable in intent, often smack of political expediency and a balancing act between appeasing progressive calls for humanity and managing conservative demands for security. The proposed Border Emergency Authority, for instance, reads like a convenient tool for managing asylum claims based on fluctuating political and logistical considerations rather than a steadfast commitment to providing refuge. While seemingly benevolent, the initiative to expedite asylum claims raises questions about the thoroughness and fairness of a rushed process. The current government is really trying to deal with the issues of illegal smuggling and illegal substances business. They've sent more soldiers to the borders to help out. They're also making more room for holding and processing people who migrate. 
They're putting more effort and resources into trying to control the situation. This is all part of their bigger plan to make the borders safer and handle the movement of people coming into the country better. What's really different from what President Trump did is how they're now making it easier for people to come to the U.S. legally. They're letting more refugees in and have set up new rules for people from certain countries to come over. This is a big change from the past administration, which was all about making it hard to get in and keeping a tight grip on the borders. It makes you wonder if this new approach is really about making things better or just trying to look good. President Biden is doing things very differently from President Trump when it comes to immigration. Trump focused a lot on keeping the borders tight, reducing the number of refugees, and making it tough for asylum seekers. Biden, on the other hand, is trying to undo a lot of Trump's rules. He wants an immigration system that is safe, but also kind and fair. Some people might think this is a great idea, but others might doubt if it's really practical or just too optimistic. Also, the Biden administration has some plans to change the immigration policies in the U.S. They want to make it easier for families to get green cards, let more refugees come in, and fix some problems with work-based green cards. They say these changes will make the immigration system more modern and fair. It's a big goal, but it's hard to know if these changes will really work or if they'll just get stuck in government red tape. Exploring the Biden administration's strategy we see its impact on politics and society, where new goals meet past decisions. Chapter two, the ongoing immigration debate. Trump had really tough rules for immigration. He wanted way fewer immigrants and people seeking safety in the US to come in. He started things like the Remain in Mexico program, where people had to wait in Mexico for their US court dates. Families were separated because of a zero-tolerance policy, and there were attempts to take away protections for young immigrants known as DACA recipients. Biden is trying to change some of these rules. He wants to stop private companies from running immigrant detention centers, but the government will still keep some detention centers open. He's planning to double the number of judges and staff who handle immigration cases because there's a big delay in processing these cases right now. He's also suggested spending $4 billion over four years to help countries in Central America. This is to help fix the problems that make people leave their homes and come to the U.S. Biden's biggest goal is to make a way for 11 million immigrants to become U.S. citizens. But this is a really hard task that no president has been able to do for a long time. Even with these efforts, Biden is getting criticized. He suggested a rule that would stop some migrants from asking for asylum in the U.S. if they enter illegally or don't try to find safety in another country first. This plan, which is meant to make border control and asylum requests more organized, has upset a lot of people who help immigrants and even some people in Biden's own party. They think he's acting too much like Trump. Different states, especially Texas under Governor Greg Abbott, are reacting in their own ways to these federal immigration changes. Often, they challenge what Biden's administration is doing. Abbott's actions show what many Republicans think, that Biden's changes might lead to more illegal immigration and more people crossing the border without permission. This whole situation is like walking on a tightrope. You have to be careful and try to balance being kind and strict at the same time, it's about moving away from old ways and trying new things, but every move is watched closely and every decision could cause trouble. The Biden administration, while trying to make its own mark, often finds itself stuck in the shadow of the past administration, fighting to show its own way of handling immigration. The reactions to President Biden's immigration strategy have been quite mixed, to say the least. On one hand, some people think he's moving towards a more kind and organized way of handling immigration. But on the other hand, even people in his own political party are saying that some of his actions are too similar to what the previous president did, which is not what he promised during his campaign. Groups that fight for immigrants' rights and legal experts are keeping a close eye on all this. They're ready to fight against any policy they think is unfair or cruel in court. The effects of these changes in policy are huge, they don't just impact the people who want to move to the U.S., but they also shape how the whole country talks and thinks about immigration, who has the right to a country, and human rights. 
As Biden's team deals with these hot topics, the results of these policy changes will probably have a big and lasting effect on how U.S. immigration policies work. Let's talk about the legal side of things, especially about a part of the law called Section 212F. This part of the Immigration and Nationality Act gives the president a lot of power to stop or limit people from other countries from entering the U.S. This power has been used by different presidents to handle what they see as threats or to make specific immigration rules. In the past, the word entry was really important in immigration law. But after the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, it changed to admission. This change affects how people are considered for entering the U.S. Now, admission means that a person enters the U.S. legally after being checked and given permission, and this includes people who enter without being checked. Using Section 212F to limit access to asylum, which is protection for people running away from danger, brings up some moral issues. This is especially true when we think about how people escaping violence and persecution are treated. The Supreme Court has made decisions that show these concerns, like in Barr v. East Bay Sanctuary Covenant. For instance, asylum seekers who entered the U.S. illegally were not allowed to get asylum status. This has put many in dangerous situations, making us question how to balance the country's safety needs with our duty to help others. There have been a lot of legal fights over how Section 212F is used, with courts playing a big role in deciding how much power the president should have. From the time of President Reagan to recent issues like the travel ban and limiting asylum under President Trump, courts have been trying to figure out how much power this law gives the president. The Supreme Court usually says the president has a lot of power to decide who can enter the country, but recent disagreements and decisions suggest that there might be new limits on this power in the future. The ongoing legal fights and moral questions show how complicated it is to balance the president's power, legal rules, and human rights. The use of Section 212F is still a key way for presidents to shape immigration policy, showing why it's so important to keep an eye on the law and think about what's right and wrong when using it. Legal debates highlight how immigration policies affect cities and communities, showing the challenges and resilience of places like New York. Chapter 3. The Hidden Costs of Moving to the City In cities like New York, life is like a complex picture made up of many parts. Right now, these cities are facing a big challenge related to immigration, a topic that often causes a lot of debate and strong feelings. New York is known for being a place where people from different backgrounds come together, but now it's facing problems because so many new people are arriving. This situation has led to not having enough resources, public services that are struggling to keep up, and worries about keeping the country safe. These issues are mixed with how the people who already live there feel about all the new people coming in. Take a look at New York City, for example. Since the spring of 2022, it has had a big problem with more than 100,000 migrants and people seeking safety, mostly from Latin America and the Caribbean, coming to the city. This isn't just a small number of people. It's a huge wave that is making it hard for the city to handle its money. The costs have already gone over $1 billion and might reach $4.3 billion by July 2024, the city's system for helping people who need a place to stay is overwhelmed. It's trying to help nearly 60,000 migrants, and two-thirds of these are families with kids. This huge number has made the city's leaders declare an emergency because they are running out of options. In trying to deal with this growing problem, local governments like New York City's are rushing to make new rules. But these rules seem more like quick fixes than real, lasting solutions. For example, there's a rule that says single adults can only stay in shelters for two months before they have to leave. This rule is supposed to help manage the number of people in shelters, but it doesn't consider that these people might end up homeless. It's a short-sighted rule that doesn't address the bigger problem of not having enough affordable housing in the city. Also, there's an effort to speed up the process for migrants to get permission to work. The plan is to get these approvals done in 30 days for some groups and to allow many people to work for up to five years. 
This might help about 60,000 Venezuelans in the city, but it points to a bigger issue, the need to help migrants become part of the workforce and reduce the pressure on local services. This effort is a good start, but it's not enough to solve the whole problem. There's also the issue of keeping the country safe, which is always there in the background. The large number of migrants coming in not only puts a strain on the city's resources, but also makes it hard to keep the country safe. The migrants come from many different places, and it's tough to process and take care of them properly. This situation is complicated and needs more than a quick look to make sure security measures are strong and reliable. The World Bank, in its World Development Report 2023, casually throws around figures like 184 million, roughly 2.3% of the global population, living outside their country of citizenship. But numbers, as they often do, mask the chaotic dance of factors behind this human movement, a dance increasingly choreographed by the whims of climate change, the crescendo of conflict, and the erratic rhythm of global demographic trends. This is the era of human mobility, a concept so intricate and immediate that it screams for effective migration policies, yet often finds but a whisper in response. Peeling back the layers of this phenomenon, it becomes clear that migration is anything but straightforward. It's a hodgepodge of influences, ranging from the predictable, economic disparities, environmental catastrophes, political turmoil, to the more intimate, personal dreams and familial bonds. The World Economic Forum, in a tone suggesting enlightened foresight, discusses demographic changes like the graying populations in wealthy nations and the plummeting birth rates in middle-income countries. These shifts hint at a future where migration isn't just about people seeking greener pastures, but also about destination countries desperately vying for a shrinking pool of skilled workers. It's a future where migration policies might be less about borders and more about labor markets. The Migration Data Portal, in an attempt to bring order to chaos, categorizes the drivers of migration into a neat list. Demographic, economic, environmental, human development, security, socio-cultural, and politico-institutional. Yet these categories intertwine in an intricate web, influencing the very personal decisions to migrate. Think economic disparities, like the gaping chasm between poverty and affluence, or environmental disasters that tear people from their homes. Then there's the omnipresent shadow of conflict and violence, alongside socio-cultural factors, the network of migrants, the prevailing gender norms, and the individual's quest for a better life. The stories of migrants themselves are often relegated to footnotes, yet they are the most telling. Many embark on treacherous journeys, fueled by a blend of desperation and hope, seeking safety, opportunity, or simply the chance to reunite with loved ones. Their paths are littered with obstacles, ranging from the Kafkaesque bureaucracy of immigration laws to the tangible dangers of their journeys. The international response to U.S. immigration policies is a mosaic of varying opinions. Some countries and international bodies advocate for more humane and comprehensive approaches, emphasizing respect for refugee rights, addressing the root causes of migration, and enhancing international cooperation for safe, orderly, and regular migration. Yet this often feels more like lip service than a concrete plan of action. To grasp the global context of migration, is to delve into a world of paradoxes and complexities. It's about understanding the multifaceted drivers, the personal narratives of those who migrate, and the global reaction to migration policies. Effective policymaking in this arena must transcend traditional boundaries, acknowledging the intricate dynamics at play. It's a challenge and an opportunity that the 21st century presents, one that demands a response as complex and nuanced as the phenomenon itself. Looking at global migration, we focus on the future of U.S. immigration policy under Biden, facing reform and resistance. Chapter 4. America's Immigration Crossroads President Biden's executive actions on the U.S. immigration system seem like just another drop in the ocean. Yet, as we delve deeper, it's clear that these changes, touted as transformative and progressive, 
are a tangled web of half measures and hopeful aspirations. Now, let's start with interior enforcement, or perhaps the lack thereof. The Biden administration has taken a step back in enforcing U.S. immigration law, seemingly embracing a policy of selective oversight. This approach includes prioritizing cases that do not focus solely on an individual's immigration status and limiting enforcement in workplaces and so-called protected areas. While this may sound humane, one wonders if this is merely a convenient veil to mask the complexities and inadequacies of the system. Then there's DACA, a program shrouded in perpetual uncertainty. The Biden administration grapples with the diminishing pool of eligible individuals, constrained by rigid entry and age requirements. The program's legal standing remains as shaky as a leaf in a storm, with little to no concrete legislative support. The American Dream and Promise Act, for instance, seems more like a distant dream than an imminent reality. Public charge rules, another hotbed of controversy, have been revised under Biden's watch. Ostensibly, these changes could enhance immigrants' access to public services. However, one can't help but question whether these revisions are substantive or mere window dressing to appease certain segments of the populace. These executive actions paint a picture of an administration walking a tightrope, trying to balance humanitarian concerns with the practicalities of governance. Yet, the cynic might argue that this is a classic case of political posturing, offering just enough to seem empathetic without making any groundbreaking changes. The story of U.S. immigration policy under Biden is one of cautious steps and hopeful rhetoric. As we navigate through these reforms, the reality seems to be a blend of pragmatic compromises and optimistic projections. The future of this policy remains as unpredictable as the paths of the immigrants it seeks to govern. In the end, it's a narrative of a nation at a crossroads, taking tentative steps towards an uncertain future. The initiative to reunify families, torn apart at the border in a move that many view as a belated attempt at rectifying a human tragedy, comes with its own set of complexities. Forming a task force is a step, but skeptics might question whether this is just another governmental apparatus, more symbolic than effective, in addressing the deep-seated issues of migration and asylum claims. The administration's expansion of humanitarian protections, including deferred action and temporary protected status, starkly contrasts its predecessor's hardline stance. This shift, while commendable for its compassion, doesn't escape criticism. Some may view it as a political maneuver, a way to distance itself from the previous regime's restrictive policies rather than a genuinely altruistic move. The increased eligibility for asylum and refugee status, while a beacon of hope for many, also raises questions about the sustainability of such policies in the long term. In terms of immigration management, the proposed strategies sound promising on paper. Improving the efficiency of the asylum system and enhancing anti-smuggling operations are necessary steps, but their execution remains a daunting task. Collaboration with regional partners is a nice diplomatic touch, yet one wonders how much of this is realpolitik and how much is genuine concern for the plight of migrants. In 2024, the U.S. government, led by President Biden, plans to spend a lot of money on immigration. They want to use about $25 billion for things like border control and immigration enforcement. This is 800 million more than last year. This money will go to hiring more border guards, better border security technology, and fighting illegal substances smuggling. They also want to spend $865 million on the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. This is to help with more people asking for asylum, reduce the delays in immigration requests, and help more refugees come to the U.S., up to 125,000 in the year 2024. DACA, which stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, is important too. It doesn't offer a way to become a U.S. citizen, but it helps a lot of people with jobs and health benefits. In 2022, President Biden tried to make DACA stronger, but there were legal problems. If DACA is stopped, many people could lose their jobs and health insurance. 
This is because people in Dhaka can't usually use government health programs like Medicaid. Each state in the U.S. has different rules for people who come to the country without permission. In 20 states, these people can pay less for college and get financial help. Some states let them have driver's licenses and health care for pregnant women and children, even if they are not legal residents. These rules can have good and bad effects on people and the whole community. Changes in immigration rules can really shake up the economy. For example, if more people come to the U.S., it can change how many people are working and what they get paid. This can also affect things like unemployment rates. These big economic changes can make the government spend more or less money. If the U.S. lets people with advanced science and technology degrees get green cards more easily, it could either help or hurt the government's money situation, depending on how you look at it. In politics, it's common to blame others. President Biden is at the center of this issue. His approach seems to be make big changes quickly, and when things don't work out, act surprised. The border crisis, getting worse with around 5,000 people coming in every day, shows this clearly. When Biden's team decided to stop the Remain in Mexico policy, it seemed like they didn't think it through. Now, the border strategy is weak and ineffective. Let's not ignore the issue with people seeking asylum. Biden wants to make it harder for them to stay in the U.S. This has made many people upset, including some in his own political party. But it seems like disagreements within the party don't really stop political decisions. The effects of these choices are real. Look at New York City, struggling with over 170,000 migrants. Some of these people are being linked to crime. This connection is both convenient for some narratives and worrying. Small towns are also feeling the impact. Places like Hakuma in California are now filled with migrants. It's like a scene from a movie. People from different countries waiting for border patrol. The increase in Chinese nationals crossing the border is huge, a 4,000% increase in the last few years. California is handling things differently than Texas. Texas has fences and guards, but California doesn't. It's like California is welcoming illegal immigrants, even offering them health care paid for by taxpayers. It's a big difference between the two states. So what do we have here? A border crisis that's getting out of hand, a president who changes policies without clear plans, states that can't agree on how to handle the situation, and communities that are stuck in the middle. It's a big mess, a problem that's both political and about people, and it doesn't look like there are any simple solutions. But then, in politics, are solutions ever simple? With everything we've talked about, do you think the way the government is handling the border issue is really about helping people, especially natives, or is the government just using the situation to get more power and control on its hidden agenda? Let us know. Smash that like and subscribe for more.